So it's my pleasure now to uh, introduce Lawrence Abbott and Brett Desmarais, who'll be giving a talk, How to Choose the Best Native Street Tree for Your Garden. Lawrence is a retired biologist and restoration ecologist who lives in San Leandro. He has been and is still a tireless advocate for habitat protection and native plants. Brett is a landscape architect and arborist. He currently serves as a landscape architect with San Francisco Public Works. Brett also lives in San Leandro, which who knew that San Leandro was such a like ecological hotspot because Stephanie lives there too, where he has advocated for adding native tree species to the city's street tree list. And he serves as the planting lead in the city's CAL FIRE grant funded restoration effort. So, and I'd like to acknowledge and thank Brett for creating the terrific California native street tree list that you'll find on the Doug Tallamy section in the Bringing Back Native Garden Tours website. You're welcome to download and distribute this list, and we hope the list is useful to you when you advocate for your local government to add more California natives to their street tree lists. So let me go now and welcome uh, Brett and Lawrence. Um, so why native uh, trees? You know, we don't have much time, so I don't need to talk about this. The way that Kathy set this all up, I mean, you've been, I've been following along, you've been learning everything. Um, you know, Doug Tallamy teaches everything about ecosystems and native plants. And so the only difference with trees to regular gardening is they say that in regular gardening, um, you know, if you're afraid to lose a plant and a plant dies and it, it traumatizes you and you shouldn't be a gardener because that happens a lot. Well, with trees, you want to have a lot more planning in advance and you want to make sure you get it right from the beginning. And so that's why we're doing this presentation and especially with street trees. And um, by the way, street trees is, um, it can be interpreted in many ways and it really shouldn't, it's really too broad a brush. It's too, um, you know, street trees in San Francisco are very different than streets that follow uh, a farm or, or a very large estate, right? So um, we're going to cover a little bit of both. You have a lot more choices for your street trees if you have uh, a lot of space, both above ground and below ground for your trees to grow. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, narrow spaces and whatnot too. So um, I don't think I need to uh, read anything on this um, slide. Next slide, please. So um, the considerations uh, for success, uh, like I mentioned before, you want to look at the space above and below ground. Uh, you want to consider everything, you know, use an ecosystems approach, like if you're planning on uh, putting solar on the south side of your roof in the near future, you certainly wouldn't want to plant a large tree on the south side of your house, right? So uh, always think about the uh, genetic potential of your tree, how big and how wide it wants to get, and think about the future and think if you, you know, if you're getting older, do you, if you want to plant uh, say a tree that grows large and you say, oh, I'll just keep pruning it smaller. Uh, think about, you know, do you really want to be out there fighting a, a tree that wants to grow to be 100 feet tall and you want it to be 20 feet tall? Same thing with shrubs, by the way, for landscape design is always, and that's what we'll focus on during this talk is, um, you know, putting the right plant in the right spot. And so uh, at the bottom, I talk about pruning and special tricks. So if you don't have space for a large tree, but you want a small tree, no problem at all. The easiest way to do that is put it in a pot, a small pot, and you have a little bonsai uh, sitting on your patio table, a larger pot, and maybe you have a six foot tall valley oak, and you won't believe all the insects and birds that that brings, especially with my favorite tree, which you might notice coming up over and over again, the California valley oak. Next. Maybe I should say, okay, so narrowing your choices. And um, so uh, what I like to do is, um, you know, first of all, take all those considerations. Then uh, for myself, well, you're lucky, first of all, I should say, if you can afford a landscape designer because they can really help you a lot. But even if you have a landscape designer or planner, um, you probably have your own ideas just walking through East Bay Regional Parks or wherever you go, botanical gardens, and of course, we always steal ideas from nature and try to, uh, for myself anyway, copy nature to not only bring the diversity to your home, but also bring, um, you know, the, the animal diversity. So um, you can decide if you want one big specimen tree or if you want to plant a whole bunch of little trees close together. Or, you know, even if you put a lot of larger trees closer together, 
they won't grow high and wide, they'll grow sort of crowded. And this is, of course, assuming you have a very large front yard. Um, so um, the reality of your um, street could be pretty brutal for plants. You know, maybe the backyard is better. Um, depends on the size of your yard, small yards, uh, or in if you're in the middle of town, uh, can be pretty brutal. The heat that comes off the sidewalk and roads and um, just the environment in general, maybe you don't get a lot of uh, water, per, maybe you don't have a lot of soil area even to create a bioswale and, you know, get water to go down in the soil. Again, fighting genetics, you, uh, I don't want to do it anymore. I'm getting too old for that. And um, yeah, and think about uh, about your tree that you're choosing. If uh, Make sure that if it is a tree that tends to have invasive roots, maybe that doesn't belong in the front yard if you have um, an old style sewer system where the roots can get in there. Um, or what kind of utilities you have underground. Brett will talk about that. So right tree in the right place. Next slide, please. And I think, Brett, is this where you're starting? Yeah. Um, thank, thank you, Brett. Sure. So uh, yeah, so planting the right tree in the right place, um, there are some considerations um, when, when choosing a tree uh, to really make sure that it's appropriate for uh, the place where you, you want to put it. So um, you know, your own yard is really the easiest place to start. Uh, and it's also a really great place for small to medium trees. Uh, because you do control that space and uh, there are very few conflicts as far as things like utilities uh, in, in a residential backyard. Um, that's not to say that a large tree couldn't work. I think we saw some examples of that in other presentations of large oaks. Um, but something to consider is that uh, California tree law does allow your neighbor to start pruning your tree if it begins to grow over their yard um, and that you are, you know, you do have to commit to that maintenance um, and potential issue. Um, so that's a factor to consider. Um, city parks are also a usually, uh, you know, very easy place uh, to provide trees for a similar reason to, to yards in that there are often, um, you know, few utility conflicts and lots of space. So it's a great place where really large trees are really large uh, native oaks uh, in city parks. Um, and so we'll talk about kind of the advocacy and working with your city to see if you can um, get more native trees planted uh, in your park system. Um, and then the third one here is street tree situations, uh, which are the most challenging. Uh, and, and there really are a lot of factors that, um, that go into that and why uh, native trees and uh, street tree situations can be difficult to navigate. Uh, next. So uh, for street tree considerations, I, what I like to say here is that this is where our goals of environmental sustainability have to also meet and reconcile with operational sustainability. Um, and so when we're working on uh, street tree plans uh, in my line of work in the city of San Francisco and really any uh, kind of municipal landscape architect or arborist, the things that, that go into making these decisions um, are uh, consideration of utility conflicts. And so that would be above and below ground. We're talking about overhead lines for power. In San Francisco, we have electrified bus lines. Uh, stoplights um, and underground. We have um, utility vaults for electrical and telecom and gas. Uh, we have this uh, storm sewer system underground. Uh, there's even you know areas where there's a subway tunnel underground. And so these are all things that can be limiting factors on the kind of tree that can be uh, placed adjacent to those utilities and be compatible with them. Um, other factors would be lines of sight, and so that would be uh, maintaining traffic safety regulations for uh, vehicle line of sight, making sure that uh, trees aren't blocking the view of a crosswalk so that pedestrian safety is taken into account. Um, and so these are all things that go into city code. Um, there are clearance requirements. Um, we like to have trees really ideally about a 10 foot uh, canopy height above uh, the street when they're directly uh, adjacent to the street so that they don't get hit by buses and trucks. Um, and then another factor that's very important is pedestrian clearances. And so that's uh, that would include things like um, you know low hanging branches. You can imagine over a sidewalk if somebody uh, used a cane and uh, had um, uh, sight issues or mobility issues that uh, low hanging branches can be a problem uh, for those people. And so we do need to factor in those requirements, which are very clearly uh, spelled out in the Americans with Disabilities Act. The next slide. Uh, and so this is an example here of where uh, street trees can be very challenging uh, to, because the spaces are, are quite narrow. Uh, we're dealing with a lot of reflected heat off of concrete and asphalt. 
And in many places we have you know, a small amount of soil, um, not a lot of space for a root zone. There may or may not be uh, good drainage in these spaces. Um, and, and this can be a very limiting factor. And I think this is a picture you took, Lawrence, is that right? Of a tree that fell this winter? Correct. Yeah. Actually, there's two trees. There's another tree right behind it cut down. Oh, right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. So this is a tree that um, wasn't really able to develop uh, an appropriate root system in this confined space. And so uh, with saturated soil and wind, it could not uh, hold onto the ground and uh, resulted in a failure here. And this can cost people lives. So this is, this is something to uh, really consider with uh, street tree plantings. The next slide. So then the other considerations, though, um, when choosing a tree, um, going back to some things that Lawrence kind of touched on at the beginning of this talk, um, is really looking at what is nature already doing uh, where you live. So if you're looking at uh, wanting to choose a native tree uh, for your yard, um, look around and see what's actually already thriving in my neighborhood. And that gives you clues about what's, a, what's really already happy and compatible with your uh, local conditions. Um, and those factors that usually kind of come into play are things like exposure, so how much sun, wind, things like fog, if you're right on the coast, um, that are um, either, you know, can be necessary for the tree uh, to develop in a, a kind of healthy way that um, reaches its full potential, uh, or they can be very limiting too. Um, consider soil type, you know, looking at soils that have lots of clay, sand, uh, loam, um, and which trees are compatible with those things. And for example, in San Leandro, we have a lot of clay. Uh, clay drains very slowly. Um, so we have some trees that uh, really want to be in sandy, quick draining soil that we have a hard time growing here. So um, the key is to really start thinking about these factors that work with the ecology that the tree evolved in so that it's um, already adapted to those conditions and you're not fighting it. Um, water availability is a factor. If uh, a tree requires supplemental water in the summertime in perpetuity, um, probably not a good choice if uh, you don't have that already happening in the landscape. Uh, but on the flip side, if it's a tree that needs to be summer dry, you don't want to plant it in the middle of a lawn. Uh, that'll end up um, shortening the lifespan of the tree as it um, encourages diseases. Uh, again, think about mature size and the compatibility there. And you know, if you're signing up for kind of ongoing um, maintenance to prune the tree to kind of keep it small, um, just, just consider that, that kind of as a long-term investment. Um, and there are a lot of helpful resources out there There's, um, it, that have this information about various trees that will kind of help you and guide you to making these selections. Uh, Calscape is, of course, an excellent website for that. Uh, I also reference uh, Select Tree, which is uh, through Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, with a lot of good information there, especially if you're uh, wanting to add a street tree in front of your house. Um, and then even websites uh, from uh, places like Las Palitas, I find very, very uh, comprehensive and useful as well. Next slide. Um, but your city's list of approved street trees can be modified uh, to include more natives. And uh, this is something that we did here in San Leandro. Uh, so I'll, I'll kind of go through that a little bit in the next few slides. Um, but consider that this change is often incremental and can be a little bit slow and involves some compromises to make it happen because you're usually dealing with a pretty large group of stakeholders to try to make this happen. Uh, we were able to get uh, slightly more than 50% of our city's uh, tree list amended to include native trees. And we consider that a success because it didn't have any when we started. Can I ask Brett, how long did it take you to move from not having any to having 50% on the street tree list? Uh, it took a few months because we had the right people involved. <laughs> it was actually pretty quick in our case. Um, but we would love to see this number increase and we think that's going to take more time. Um, uh, parks departments are often uh, a really great place to start as well because there are fewer considerations there's, uh, with parks. There's, there are usually fewer people involved in making these decisions because you don't have the utility and traffic overlays and those people involved that you need to convince about things. So uh, parks are, are really kind of the low hanging fruit of getting more native trees in your, in your landscape uh, in, in the municipal places. Um, and then of course, backyards, uh, even better. Uh, so what you can do um, in your own place. Um, so then the, um, 
the, the last thing that I want to touch on here and, and that was so important um, was really the uh, the fact that we built a coalition of citizens here in San Leandro to make that happen. Um, when the city uh, announced that they were going to be pursuing um, a grant from CAL FIRE, uh, 5,000 trees to be planted, funded through that grant, we uh, so many people were very excited by this. Um, but at the same time, we realized, hey, actually, we, we really don't have a great street tree list here at all. It's kind of has, we have our sort of um, usual suspect of, of trees where we're not happy with crepe myrtles, ginkgos, calorie pear, kind of things we, we don't want to see more of. If we're planting 5,000 trees, this is an amazing opportunity to plant native trees. Um, so uh, when we had uh, you know, sort of a critical mass of people together uh, with this goal, we engaged with the city and we had a really receptive uh, sustainability manager here in San Leandro um, who, who listened to that and we were able to um, start working with the city to amend that list. If we go to the next slide. Um, this was our, our sort of community generated wish list of native trees. So uh, this group, I think we, we call ourselves the uh, uh, Citizens for Homegrown Habitat uh, or Neighbors for Homegrown Habitat. Uh, through a Google group, uh, we began to um, kind of put our heads together and think about the different types of uh, native trees uh, that made sense here in San Leandro um, and classifying them in ways that would help us go to the city and say, we think these trees can work if you put them in these conditions. So we had small, medium, and large trees. Um, we looked at things like, um, you know, stuff that summer water needs and overall sort of uh, um, water use, uh, according to the, the Wu calls um, uh, categorization whether they were uh, friendly with overhead utilities, sort of the overall kind of minimum uh, uh, tree planting pit size that would be required, seasonality, overall um, you know, mature tree size, and everything we were working with here was, was native to the California floristic province. So everything was native within you know, this, this ecological region. So this is kind of where we started. Um, and then if we go to the next page, uh, this is where we ended up. And so, as I mentioned, we did not have native trees uh, to choose from in our initial list. And everything that's highlighted in green, and I know this is this is hard to read uh, at this scale, but you can see just visually all the green uh, line items, these are native trees. Uh, and so that amounted to 52% um, of the 5,000 trees in the grant goal uh, as native. Um, and we had, I think, five native oak species in here. We had, um, we had Aeschylus, we had um, Cyanothus, we had uh, Toyon, we had um, really a, a big range of, of um, types of trees uh, for all different types of conditions uh, in the public right away and the park system. Next slide. Then uh, this, this is a photo of our, um, one of our early plantings. This was at Bonaire Park uh, in San Leandro. Um, and uh, we got a great turnout. This was last uh, fall, I think it was September, kind of a, a strangely rainy day in September. Uh, and we were planting alders and Pacific wax myrtle. And I think we had some oaks in there. Is that right, Lawrence? Yeah, we did. We did. I think we had some valley oaks in there. Uh -huh. um, and, and, had, and coast live oak too. Coast live oak, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we had, um, we had families in the neighborhood uh, that turned out we had uh, high school students from the cross country team. Um, some people were experienced with planting trees. Other people had never done it before, um, but it was really a, a lot of um, kind of synergy here happening between um, the, the cities uh, kind of guiding this along with um, a nonprofit partner <clears throat> and uh, people in the city who were very, very excited about making this happen. And Brett, by now, many of those people have been trained as tree leaders, and they're training other people. So, I mean, it's just all good when community gets together and, and you know, fights for greening spaces the right way. So it's really been wonderful. Uh, next slide, please. I'm not going to talk about the next couple slides. Um, all of our tree leaders that you saw, most of those folks in that picture, They've learned uh, how to plant trees according to the International Society of Arboriculture standards, which are pretty much the standard now. You know, they've been working for many years with um, UC Davis, uh, 
uh, botanists and um, arborists and uh, really refining the techniques. So we have a lot of success. I think to date, we haven't actually lost a single tree that we planted and we've already had about five or six tree plantings. And Brett and I try to help with as many of them as there are. And by the way, we can't cover everything in this talk. So um, we invite you all to come down um, and uh, do a tree planting with us and you know, speak to Brett or myself or whoever's there and, uh, and pick our brains. And at the same time, you can learn these techniques hands-on and plant some trees. Next slide, please. So um, there's more of the proper way to plant those. And the easiest way to find this, if you uh, can't get a hold of this link, although we'll post these links in the chat, um, is to just do a Google search or internet search um, and just ask for International Society of Arboriculture um, standards for tree planting or for pruning or whatnot. Next slide, please. And uh, so here is um, the, uh, the link. The first link uh, is the link to come and uh, sign up to get uh, emails for whenever we're going to do a tree planting and where and when, the logistics. And uh, as I said, come join us. Uh, next slide, please. So here's the um, the beginning of some of our photographs of street trees. And um, Stephanie or Kathy, feel free to join in if these are your photographs. And by the way, I appreciate everybody that sent those pictures. We couldn't include them all. And we tried to focus on photographs and stories that you sent us that were clearly street trees because you know native trees are wonderful, but um, we're trying to get them right on the sidewalk, right near the sidewalk. And so that's what we're going to show you here. In fact, Brett, speak speak up on any of these too, because I think this is a sycamore. My screen's really sure. Small. Yeah, this is a photo from San Francisco. This is um, Platinus racemosa Roberts cultivar. It's our native California sycamore, uh, planted in um, a, a rather high water table but um, sandy area of San Francisco. Um, and this is a, a much more appropriate tree than the non-native sycamore. It's much more vigorous and adapted uh, and, and does not have the powdery mildew issues that we see on the non-native. Uh, and so this is a tree that's become increasingly available uh, in the nursery trade. That's one of my favorite trees and I have it, I planted it in my front yard about 20 years ago in about a one gallon size. And now it's over 30 feet tall and it's had amazing birds nesting in it, uh, including hawks. Next slide, please. Um, this was another um, street tree planting in San Francisco. This is uh, Quercus tomentella, the island oak. Um, and this is a very windy site, um, but with some good access to groundwater. This was a bit of an experimental planting, uh, but these trees have grown quite a bit since they went in about two years ago. They're, they're very happy. Um, and so we wanted to see if we could start to incorporate some native oaks uh, in, in uh, this street tree situation. Brett, what have you done to... Um to be very confident that there's enough soil there so that those trees aren't gonna blow over like we saw in another slide. Sure, um, so in this particular case, the tree bits are, are actually um, larger than the standard. Um, and uh, in some places we have actual um, kind of trenching underneath the sidewalk areas with uncompacted soil um, that allows the roots to uh, expand outward uh, under the uh, deeper under the paved areas. Thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, this is another one I took here at San Leandro. Of, um, this is a native oak uh, on Estadio Avenue by the San Leandro Public Library. Lawrence and I were trying to ID this one. I, I thought it was Quercus chrysolepis, um, but we weren't 100% sure. <laughs> we can fight about it afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> Next slide, please. <laughs> Oh, this is a fun one. We we really had this is I think this was our last planting. Is that correct? It was. Yeah, and it was uh in between all the storms. And uh, why don't you talk about the plants that you chose? And I think you actually designed this landscaping. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, this is a, uh, an industrial area in um, San Leandro. This was kind of a, a throwaway space um, uh, next to a warehouse, uh, but it's a city-owned uh, piece of property and. Um, we actually have pretty good soil here. It was loamy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in some of the wider parts of this strip, we fit in, I think, about 12 of these uh, Quercus wislazeni, the interior live oak. And then in the narrower stretches, we have um, uh, heteromeles, the uh, toyon. So we're really trying to create some kind of bird uh, habitat space here. Uh, 
And I'm really hoping that if we do enough of this in these kinds of spaces throughout town, we'll, we'll get that kind of critical mass of, of, um, of trees that will help birds and insects uh, and can really create that kind of mosaic of spaces across the city. And thank you, Hope, for saying that comment. Nice. I agree. It's just amazing. We, you know, we're familiar with these plants, especially with Toyon. And just imagine what that'll be like in a few years where now, you know, this is industrial space is, you know, a good spot for the cedar waxwings and robins to stop and uh, and nesting and whatnot. So, you know, you asked somebody just asked a question about understory. We are working pretty closely with another group that popped up in town at the same time that Brett mentioned, the um, Homegrown Habitats Group. And we have uh, links to that at the end also, um, where um, we're hoping to come back later. But in the meantime, we have a lot of mulch there, which will help improve the soil further and you know, help with water absorption and, and prevent water loss during the summer. So next slide, please. So this is a slide that, um, Kathy, did you send me this one? Just a Coast Live Oak, I think, in a roundabout in Berkeley, if I'm correct. I did. This was the start of the neighborhood pollinator pathway in Berkeley that's open on Saturday, May 6th. This oak is a Coast Live Oak. It was planted in 2005 in the parking, in the uh, traffic circle. What a great place for a big oak. And I just can't wait, you know, 100 years from now to just imagine what that'll be like. Next slide, please. Are you familiar with this one? I am. Um, I sent yeah. it. This oh, is please, a please. Uh, oh, it's, it's an oak, I think, and it was taken on the Contra Costa campus, which Contra Costa Community College has this fantastic, extensive uh, native plantings around now. They started some years ago, and they're just gorgeous. And so this is one of them. I absolutely love that. You know, I, I love the more we get away from uh, popsicle trees, whenever we have the space that lets us do it and get to more of the natural form, it just thrills me. Next slide, please. So um, one of the things to consider, if you call an arborist, say, to shape your tree, um, they're likely to prune everything according to ISA standards. And if it's a small tree, uh, they'll start to shape the scaffold and whatnot. But do let them know, you know, they're focused on the health of the tree and the safety of the tree uh, and, you know, the future health and safety of it. So they're, they're developing the scaffold that will grow into a strong tree that will last many, many years. But at the same time, you know, the ISA standards might be cutting off crossing branches or too many branches towards the center of the tree. But bird nests uh, love to be built in hidden spots. So, you know, let let your arborist or your um, your landscape designer or contractor know what your goals are whenever you're planting trees. That's a bush tit nest. Next slide, please. And uh, same thing if uh, in my uh, mind i always want to see more snags i want to see more places for woodpeckers to build natural cavities uh street trees probably not too practical to have you know the, the danger of a snag falling on somebody so bird boxes next slide please and uh, i think another just a example of uh, oaks right along a street and you can just imagine how incredible that will be in the future because it's already wonderful next slide please oh wow that's the enough. This is. Can I pop in? This is Anita Please Pereira's do. garden in Richmond. Her garden is on the tour. You can see it on matter, uh, Saturday, May the sixth. And uh, the slope to the right was once just a solid mass of ivy. And Anita has seen. I uh, think she, she's counted twenty-one bird nests in her garden in the last four or five years. Next slide, please. Lovely. This Anita. is the Bart uh, Station in um, Albany. Uh, on, um, I think, Solano, by Solano Avenue, somewhere around there, across the street from that uh, Brazilian um, restaurant. So you can see that, you know, a lot of uh, shrubs um, can also be uh, small trees. And you can, um, some of these, I mean, this is just wonderful. Next slide, please. So this is Stephanie's house. You want to talk about this, Stephanie? This is pretty cool. Yes, so um, this is the side strip around my property and here in San Leandro, it's the responsibility of the homeowners to keep that in shape. And you can also on the upside um, get a tree planted when you choose from the city's list. This was uh, last March, so it's just over a year ago and the list wasn't quite there yet, but as Brett said, we were working on it and I bought this life, uh, Coast Life Oak myself. And then this guy on the left, a city person, planted it for me. They did a really nice job planting it. And so I paid for the tree, but the city 
was willing to plant it. So I can't wait for it to grow up. And I'm thinking if you live in a city where there's not yet native trees on the list, maybe try that. Just say, uh, you know, how about a native one? I'll buy it. Would you, would, would I be able to plant it? Because um, a lot of the street folks or in San Leandro, Lawrence, you might've uh, had the same experience. I asked, well, why no native trees? And they were like, uh, no real reason. That's literally <laughs> what they said. Well, and this a, is not a very wide parking strip, is it? Like two and a half right. feet, something like that? It's three feet wide. It's not very wide. And I want to say, so this was um, gra like actually a couple of things. There used to be a lot of parking on here. So it's a pretty challenging spot because the soil is compacted. I got the city to actually, because the street's super narrow, one time a fire truck couldn't even get through. So they made it no parking on that side. So now I had the guts to actually have that tree there. And the, the tree guy said, don't do the gravel, put, put mulch all along that um, median there or that side strip because it'll, it'll make the soil just so much more... Um, uh, soft or useful for, for the tree. So it might just have to grow wide in one direction. Fingers crossed. Yeah, and I think it's pretty safe bet because um, Stephanie lives just a few hundred feet from the San Leandro Creek and the area is alluvi more alluvial soil and the water table is also very high. So if you're gonna plant anything like that in a very narrow strip, uh, if you have those kind of soil conditions, uh, valley oak or live oak, uh, or a valley, yeah, valley oak or coastal live oak are just ideal because their roots go down really deep. They go into the water table, and I think it's going to be fantastic there. And you'll see a picture of a very old, uh, same kind of tree in a narrow strip later, and it'll blow your mind. Next slide, please. We have about three more minutes, Lawrence, just so okay, you know. So let's just go through these. Um, did anybody want to say anything about these? Otherwise, we'll just zip through them. Yeah, this Next is a uh, coastal live oak planting. Um, I think this might have been out near Livermore or Dublin, um, uh -huh. but further east in the East Bay. Wonderful. Next slide, please. Um, this is some uh, shot this of somebody's front uh, yard. My front yard. So this is a, a coast live oak on the left. My husband and I planted it when it was six inches tall 30 years ago, and it's now about 25 feet tall. And that's a buckeye on the right that we planted from seed about 24 years ago. These keystone species keep popping up over and over, huh? Next slide, please. So this is a, a buckeye. You saw it with leaves on one picture, and here it is uh, with some summer drought. So if you discontinuing watering and just let them get the water that they would get from the season, uh, that's what they'll look like uh, midsummer. Next slide, please. There's that oak I was talking about in quite a narrow strip, and uh, <laughs> I'd say it's doing pretty well. Next slide, please. Uh, this is, I think, a Ceanothus in San Francisco. I think oh, it's San there Francisco. it is, right there. Yeah, Mission in San Francisco. Pretty awesome. Next slide, please. So this was just taken at the um, Hedgerow Farms. I just went to the uh, California Native Grasslands Association uh, annual meeting over there, and they've planted all these plants uh, right along the road, and it's just amazing. For, I love this. You probably couldn't get away uh, with this in certain cities because uh, it's probably a uh, wouldn't meet their code or whatever, but I love to see a lot of natives planted together and actually see some overstory, some you know com complexity to the structure. And this is what birds absolutely love, and, and what we need to see more of is, uh, and it could be cleaned up a little and still be incredibly valuable. But to have different species of natives filling in the mid story and the understory is so beneficial to wildlife. Next slide, please. And this is San Leandro, uh, not too far from San Leandro Creek. It was a mast year. I don't know if you can see, but the sidewalk is covered in acorns. And I'm still giving away uh, acorns from uh, this coast live oak. Uh, it's one of the probably original uh, you know, lineage right here in San Leandro. And uh, if you want to grow one, my contact information is at the end of this presentation. Next slide, please. So this is just not far from there. And uh, this is a valley oak that's just spectacular. It's at the corner of Juana and uh, shoot, what's the other street? Well, it's on Juana. If you drive down Juana and San Leandro, you'll see this. It's a massive tree. The canopy goes from one side of the street to the other. And I have plenty of acorns for this too that have been kept in the refrigerator if you wanna, uh, if you have some nice deep soil and you wanna put a valley oak. Next slide, please. And this is a Valley Oaks just taken a few days ago as the snow melts uh, on the way to my daughter's house in Modesto. And uh, they can take a lot of flooding and just do fine. And there's my contact information. Really enjoyed this. Thanks so much, Kathy.
it was great to have this presentation. It was very exciting. I want to congratulate you. And like, I want to move to San Leandro. That's going to be my next home so I can be your neighbors. Hey, we're so lucky, man. It's, it's really amazing when you find a kindred, kindred spirits right in your right in your own backyard. 